I'll describe what I'm what I'm uh, seeing as well, and you will have a copy of the of the the, the lecture, as you said. So, um, and again, I will. Um, last, I was very uh, grateful to be invited uh, um, uh, several months back to talk about ADHD, and I, I spent um, uh, a long time talking about the neurobiology, which you'll be able to go back to. So, I'm um, I'm not going to reflect on that today um, because you've got that all there. But I'm going to speak very very briefly about ADHDs. The difference between the 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 co the core symptoms, the uh, conditions that look like ADHD, and why that can sometimes muddle diagnosis, but then move very quickly onto the comorbidities and why um, neurodiversity uh, is is should be seen um, very much as a collective thing with ADHD, but it can very much stand on its own, but it's often very much accompanied by other 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 conditions that have um, a really important role in day to day life for your young people. Um, so the slide that I have here is uh, shows a very complex uh, Venn diagram with just A's and B's in it, which just, just symbolizes the complexity of the interaction of these conditions. Um, and I, and the, the point that I want to discuss and I really, really, really want to hear from you is how we communicate that with the, the um, professionals that we need to work with every day primarily school because that's what your kids are that's the kids work that's where they are most days um and um i, I think if i had to say probably about uh 50 of what i talk about in clinics and emails is adhd the rest is uh, accompanying things like um housing um finance but mostly the rest of it is around interactions with school. And we have a really good relationship with, with the vast majority of, of, of school um, and challenging relationships with uh, with uh, one or two, but it's never, never combative. It's always interesting. Um, and we, again, it's always something to learn. But I think what I want to hear is what's gone right for you in interacting with schools and how we can help. So uh, what are those core, uh, core key core symptoms? Uh, what are the pathways? So if you, for example, think, well, I, I wonder if my child's got dyslexia. Um, how do I how do I go about getting that diagnosed and what happens next? What is available out there? And, and I think this is, again, where you're going to reflect back to, to me a little bit more uh, as well. Uh, and what should those early discussions look like? So core symptoms, as, as you're uh, very well aware of, are hyperactivity, distractibility, impulsiveness in, in various different um, amounts. There's no one size fits all for this condition, as you know. Uh, both in adults and in children. Um, um, uh, there are lumpers and splitters in diagnosticians. Some people like to put all of these together in ADHD and some like to split the um, non-hyperactive form off as ADD. I'm, 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 um, I'm a lumper because I think it's probably all a very complex um, genetic and neurobiological condition but it presents in different ways. Um, and I think the other thing is to say that children need change. So when children are presenting, um, and normally I'm seeing, um, I'm always going to see children first under the age of 11, that's our diagnostic um, admission criteria for our, our clinic. Um, but uh, children change hugely. I mean, we all know this from, from a, the, the bouncy five-year-olds up to the, 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 the furrow-browed teenager and everything in between. And that condition uh, that you will first see and diagnose is going to change. So um, I think uh, saying that there are separate conditions uh, in terms of within the umbrella of ADHD probably isn't helpful, but I'm, I'm more than happy to have a, um, a debate over a coffee with, uh, with any uh, parent or clinician. So sidebar, are conditions that look like ADHD and may be treated similarly. And this is what I spend a lot of time when I first meet families um, in that uh, diagnostic um, uh, interview that we first do. And this is what we bring that's slightly different from um, uh, psychiatry child and mental health um, clinicians because we do a physical examination and take a full um, organic history um, and, and are much a, much more able to investigate things if we need to. to. So for example fetal alcohol syndrome and that's why I ask that, that always slightly awkward question about alcohol intake during pregnancy and I always say um, please don't feel uh, offended I always ask everybody because the parameters for the causation of fetal alcohol are still being examined and it it, it may be just a, a, a couple of glasses of wine at the wrong time can a, a affect brain development but because it's very hard to, for clinicians to direct exactly how much when 
um, that we tend to say uh, don't drink at all, which is very much a different <laughs> different uh, advice that people were given for over many years. And again, this is this is up for debate. But fetal alcohol syndrome can be quite subtle, um, and they present in very similar ways to early ADHD, poor attention span, moodiness, learning difficulties. Um, but it's a, a condition that um, something that is harder to treat in terms of managing those symptoms. Um, for those of you who are involved with the looked after child um, or adopted or fostered or in any other um, um, iterations of that, um, you may be uh, with a child who has fetal alcohol. But what I do tend to try to pick out is those children who have ADHD as well, because um, as uh, we'll mention, I'll, I'll mention in passing, for those adults who were under, undiagnosed or not diagnosed um, or a late in diagnosis may have spent a considerable amount of their um, young adult life um, self-medicating with alcohol. So you may have that condition, that circumstance when you've got both, both ADHD and fetal alcohol syndrome. A again, I'm a very much of the opinion is that there's not one size fits all nor one diagnosis that necessarily explains everything. And there's also a dynamic picture. Um, so uh, I will always explore ADHD in somebody really sometimes with quite obvious fetal alcohol syndrome syndrome um, um, features and there are some physical features that I'm not going to talk about in too much detail because again they, they, they can be very subtle um, uh, but uh, we have a specialist service in Surrey that helps us out with that diagno diagnosis as well. Neurofibromatosis um, is an autosomal uh, dominant condition and that means that if you have it then you've got about a 50% chance of passing it on to your offspring um, and it uh, affects uh, young people, adults uh, with uh, skin changes uh, and most notably for young people we see uh, sort of freckles, moles and when I asked to have a look at your child's armpits for those who have met me in a diagnostic uh, uh, session that's what, I'm that's what I'm looking for is a collection of axillary uh, freckling more than you would normally see. Everybody has freckles, everybody has birth masks, masks birth mar marks, sorry. Um, and if you are of mixed heritage, then your skin tone is going to uh, potentially throw up some um, uh, uh, some uh, skin tone changes that your doctor may need to have a little bit more detailed look at. And that's the reason why looking for um, uh, uh, marks that might suggest a neurodevelopmental problem. Very rare, uh, uh, but something we look for. Other genetic conditions as well. There's a whole range and more. We're finding more and more as we do more uh, gen genetic testing. Um, but all of these can be associated with high levels of activity. And that's why we look for that within neurofibromatosis. Um, the classic genetic condition is fragile X. Um, and uh, that's something that affects boys predominantly. Um, and we're seeing less and less of it, interestingly, but um, for, for probably um, interesting social reasons, I'd imagine. Um, but um, it's something we look out for. The, the, the really interesting one for us is hyperkinesis associated with ASD. And I write that in a condition list for those of you who may have met me um, and have that on your list. Um, it is a, a, a children with a, a ASD who are super hyperactive to the point that they can't sit down and concentrate, but haven't yet or will ever have a diagnosis of ADHD. That's when we sometimes treat with the ADHD medicines. And I'm happy to talk to anybody separately about it. Um, well can present with them um, agitation, hyperactivity, but brain injuries themselves might be related to ADHD. And as uh, Valencia mentioned, I worked at the Children's Trust in Tadworth where we looked after children who had been involved with um, accidents, traumatic brain injuries. Um, and a number of those had had accidents, um, very unfortunately, in relation to their ADHD. Um, uh, this was an international uh, uh, group of patients, uh, so I'm pleased to say that uh, many of those were not from the UK, um, but uh, it's obviously something that we worry about. And again, for those who've met me recently, I've been uh, very keen to ask you to consider applying for a hidden disabilities blue parking badge, which if you Google the government website, um, they ask you for examples of when your child has put themselves at risk in relation to ADHD. And you can get a disabled badge and park in the, those places uh, uh, quite legitimately because it's an important safety thing for your family. OK, so I just thought I'd throw this in very quickly. This is um, ADHD calming ideas. And I, it's just to sort of, again, a little sidebar. Had to do a summer 
yes, it's been a very strange summer with uh, with COVID. Please don't forget to use your wand card if you haven't already applied for that. Please use the letters that I've written if you've seen me in clinic. For those who are Wandsworth based, if you're outside of Wandsworth, um, every local authority has a special educational needs register. And as part of registering with, it, with this, the, the, the bonus thing that you get is a, a card with um, activities uh, to do that are free or um, discount in your local borough. For Wandsworth, it's things like the um, recumbent bikes at uh, Battersea you can hire for an hour for free. The, the children's zoo in Battersea, flip out their special sessions for that. But uh, really important to try and get outside. We're allowed to do that now. Uh, vitamin D, sleep, absolutely important. Meditation, they say, then mindfulness. And there's a lot of thought around mindfulness and mindfulness gaming happening at the moment. Um, and I just apologise for the noise in the background. It's our, our uh, refuse collectors. <laughs> you wonder what that noise is. OK, so non-core symptoms, which aren't comorbid, aren't comorbidities a part of the, the PhD, but really important. We talked a little bit about these last time, but I'm just going to whip through these. But just to say that these are not classic comorbidities, they will be described as part of ADHD, but don't need a separate diagnosis um, unless you uh, have got an educational psychologist who's made a, a diagnosis for you of working memory problems or processing difficulties um, and auditory processing, which we struggle sometimes to get diagnosed because um, the services that we mostly at Great Ormond Street are very open subscribed but I will always try my best to get an appointment for you there if we can. Executive dysfunction that we talked a lot about last time is a, probably I think a core cool feature of ADHD because it's so persistent right into adulthood and I have a picture here of a man covered in uh, post-it level uh, post-it notes to try and remind himself to do things. Oppositional behaviours we try to cut off as soon as we can and that's something that I think just Totally associated with all of the time and in fact there was this condition opposition disorder which is to be less prominent and I certainly don't diagnose it because I think you are in danger of labeling a child as having considerable oppositional behaviors that is a medical condition and it's it's not because it it, it forms part of a, a number of other conditions another uh, part of just behavior and sometimes environment for those people who have challenging environments uh, being exposed to domestic abuse domestic violence or in um, uh, housing that is inadequate oppositional behaviors is children putting the foot down in the only way that they know that they can so um, it's something that gets scored in the SNAP score for schools and when we uh, 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 do that assessment for your diagnosis I will make mention of oppositional behaviours but we try to work with the schools to try to um, help children with oppositional behaviours rather than label them as difficult or naughty children because that is such a such a, uh, um, a, a thing that has been um, difficult to help children with over the years. So conduct behaviours uh, again, uh, again tends to affect the teenagers again uh, 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 criminal uh, criminal behaviours and not necessarily involving the police but you hope to avoid that and self medication uh, which we talked about briefly alcohol and drug use um, and again this is something we try to um, talk very honestly and openly with our teenagers um, I will see everybody from the age of thirty and upwards very briefly just to have a quick chat with them and sometimes I'm embarrassingly direct with our teenagers asking about sex drugs gender um, gangs exploitation. Um, and most will tell me there's nothing wrong and then the parents will tell me exactly what is wrong a little bit later on, which is to say that we have that in mind. I'm going to come back to anxiety, but that can be part of ADHD, uh, but can maintenance difficulties. I was reading a paper yesterday saying that um, uh, ADHD circadian, circadian rhythm, so our normal rhythms are actually so significantly out of kilter that you uh, actually are expecting to go to sleep at about 10 or 11 o'clock waking up at three or four in the morning is a sort of natural part of ADHD. Now um, I need to read that in a little bit more detail before that becomes part of what we uh, tell families to expect but you know and I know that sleep is um, a, a nightmare <laughs> with children with ADHD. They just don't want to go to bed um, so that in itself can become a pathological thing and we will refer to the children's sleep uh, specialist services at Evelina and Southampton um, if we are really struggling. 
emotional disturbances up and down, uh, puberty, all of those things can be part of ADHD um, and, and developmental problems, which can be part of uh, just a developmental picture, fine motor skill problems, hyperextendability of the joints. But I'm going to go on to dyspraxia in just a minute. So comorbidities are those conditions that are separate from ADHD, but occur uh, with them. So the absolute classics, classic ones, many of whom you will be really familiar with, but if you aren't, this may be a, uh, an opportunity to think about them and think about asking for further work or further, further, further thoughts or further thoughts. Autism spectrum disorder you will be very familiar with. That's about 30% to 30 of those children with ADHD um, and for those of you who've been diagnosed with uh, uh, autism spectrum disorder thinking about ADHD other way around uh, it's like 20 to 30 percent have got ADHD. Specific learning difficulties, dyslexia, dyscalculia, uh, tics and Tourette's, dyspraxia and developmental coordination difficulties and anxiety. So um, I won't linger on this too much because you've got it here, but I thought this was quite a nice uh, uh, little schematic for autism, um, uh, highlighting particularly things like oversensitivity to sound um, uh, and uh, difficulties with uh, relating to others. Um, and there's a, a, a charity and I, all of the ones I've chosen hopefully should have charity um, um, or information um, uh, uh, um, links there. So this one is um, Halcyon. Um, Tourette syndrome and again there's just a little bit more detail on Tourette's and tics um, just about the different types but I, the, the, I just wanted just to, you to have a little look at that and there are a number of children that do have uh, uh, Tourette's or tics and um, we work with Helen Simmons at the Learning Disability Camps, who has a, a, a tick clinic, and she she is looking at her triage system at the moment because, unfortunately, like many of our services, is, uh, are, are somewhat overwhelmed at the moment. But overlapping condition interrupts sixty four percent of ADHD. Um, the thing that I, I want you to remember about uh, ticks or Tourette's is that they come and go. They have a natural flow. So um, uh, often a number of the emails that we have from families are when uh, when ticks have become very distressing. And we'll often say, let's wait and see. And that's not because we are um, not wanting to take action. It's because ticks will often level themselves out. Um, but uh, uh, just to, to, to know this is very much part of sort of ADHD anxiety. Um, I'm going to start doing a little bit more work in our clinic on anxiety because it's been such a feature of the last few months and I think this has been very much part of COVID and going back to and from schools, uh, you know, going into a school classroom that you're not used to if you uh, um, a number of uh, schools are assessments over the assessments when they get back to school and I know that a lot of our people wanting but anxiety can be a separate condition as well and there's, there's a big family history from from that um, uh, and as you can see there's another concentrating is very much part of anxiety and you know yourself if you're worried about something um, all bets are off for concentrating on things if you're worried. It's like when you're, uh, you know, physically in pain, so a mental illness when you are, uh, you know, essentially in a sort of mental distress or pain state, you're not going to be able to concentrate. So um, this is can be part of um, ADHD itself, but can be separate because um, uh, generalised anxiety um, conditions are very common. Um, so what we will be asking about is if you have intrusive thoughts, fast heart rate, sweating, agitation, um, and as you can imagine, you moving around a lot, that can look like hyperactivity. So um, I, I think it's very important to make sure that we don't miss it. Um, um, and why, this is why we rely on you as families to say, do you, do you know what? I think this anxiety is separate from the ADHD or it's much, much worse. Um, and it can come out like anger and defiance. And again, that's where these things all cross over. So people who are anxious tend to be negative. They can be anger, angry, they can be challenging. Um, and I met with a family yesterday whose child has anxiety almost exclusively in relation to school. And interestingly, his dad almost had exclusive anxiety in relation to school. But it doesn't mean that either the dad or the child doesn't have ADHD. I mean, we need a little bit more time and what we call watchful waiting to see what happens when this child's now moved to a new school um, to see what happens. But we have some questionnaires um, and I was uh, mentioning there there's something called the scared questionnaire which children can do and I'm going to start doing a little bit more work with that with our young people to see whether they have um, like 
generalized anxiety disorder. If that's the case, then we can help look at that with you, um, working with the schools, working with you. Um, herbal remedies can be helpful and a nice cup of calamine tea. I know it sounds silly, but it's part of your family uh, discussions at the end of the day. You are doing things like uh, cognitive behavioural therapy with your children all the day, uh, asking them what's the worst that might happen. Again, a family yesterday, um, their uh, poor young person was totally obsessed with the news, totally overwhelmed by the ideas of apocalypses and tsunamis and disasters which makes complete sense given that we've been in the middle of a global pandemic and the family were working really hard to talk them through that and, and to remove any sources of stress like newspapers and, and the news and, and it was working really, really well for them. Um, so uh, medications that I can work with you for your children, things like beta blockers, which are um, you may be familiar with, um, they help reduce that sort of uh, that racing heart feeling that can make you feel anxious. Um, anxiety medication I can work with, and I have a number of fa families whose children are taking anxiety medication. Again, it's only for a very short time. Uh, allows you to access some, some behavioural strategies but can make a big difference and of course we work for, with tier three CAMs um, as well. Um, so sorry just a, the, the point I was going to make is that um, I can make that diagnosis um, and I can work with CAMs to make that diagnosis. The diagnosis I can't make is dyslexia because that's an educational diagnosis. I think that's really important because families will come and say I'm not sure whether my child is dyslexic um, and I will say um, I'm going to direct you to the educational psychologist or liter literacy advisor at school. If you're in the private sector, unfortunately, that is, is not a given uh, because uh, you're not under the, the care of local authority. Now, I'm, I'm waiting for a family to challenge that. Um, I'd be delighted to hear if somebody uh, manages to secure funding for that. But and in the meantime, most families in the private sector will seek a private educational uh, psychology assessment, um, which I will always, always honour, but I will always look at it just to, to, to make sure that uh, you have chosen wisely with your educational psychologist. That forward. A lot of famous people with dyslexia there, so it is it is common. The schools in the mo most in the mainstream can support um, a dyslexia, but there are specialist schools who are rare and expensive. And if you are working with the local authority, um, they will challenge you uh, to uh, d um, show that this is the school that you need. And, and, and I think that's perhaps something we need to discuss in, in a moment. So an informatic here on dyslexia, again, just for your own information um, about how dyslexia is not low intelligence, although it's classified as a specific learning difficulty. It's about the ability to learn, not about your cognitive abilities. But the upshot is if you don't uh, diagnose or support dyslexia, then you might have uh, the outcome which we don't want, which is lower academic achievement. Um, uh, dyspraxia. So I've got um, a picture here of, and its name has just gone out of my head, um, Daniel Radcliffe, sorry, the actor who played Harry Potter, who uh, talks about his own dyspraxia. So dyspraxia uh, can affect the body in different ways. So um, your ability to use your hands to do uh, small tasks, your ability to think about things, ideation or dyspraxia, the ability Verbal, that's very unusual, but we do see some children with that, and that can be very disabling actually for children if a child can't physically produce the words. Um, and we work with our speech and language therapist. Um, and you need both a doctor and an occupational therapist. So if you think your child has either a dyspraxia or a, d a developmental coordination disorder, and I've got a slide for that next, um, ask me, I will do a neurological examination and then I will refer you to an occupational therapist who will do the ABCD assessment. Um, and uh, we will then liaise and decide whether you have a dyspraxia diagnosis. And again, that's a conversation to have this with the school um, about how to help support your child in the classroom. Laptops, uh, specialist seating, specialist exercises are really important. Um, a very complex slide around the, all the different areas of dyspraxia um, affecting, and um, to point you to the, 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 the couple of green box, uh, green circles at the bottom, concentration. If you cannot balance, uh, your pen sit still, um, it can come across as hyperactivity and it can affect your concentration as well. So all of these things you can see in plates on the, on the sticks and you wobble the stick until the plate keeps spinning. Unless you manage all of these things in the right order in the right, right time with a sort of flexible approach, um, then um, your child can get distracted and not be able to make the best of their school time. 
So then slide here on uh, co-occurring conditions in DCD and about 50% of children with DCD may meet the diagnostic criteria for ADHD. So again, that, that big crossover and again, crossover with autism spectrum disorder, which has its own coordination difficulties uh, um, for those of you who do have children with ASD and also ADHD comorbid. These are children that can blunder into things because they're so keen to get to the thing that they want to do. And whilst they're being driven by their ADHD uh, and with hyperactivity, they can be quite a maelstrom of activity and clumsiness. And we do have a number of families who tell me that the number of things that they, they break uh, can, be, uh, can be very frustrating and expensive. So the ASD pathway, and I can just rattle through this. Um, this is now, uh, this has been a lot of work's gone into this, and I, I'd imagine a number of you have been involved with this process. Um, but um, the uh, Thrive, which is the early help um, uh, uh, system through Wandsworth, have now what's called an emerging needs pathway. Um, your paediatrician, so that might be ADHD, any of my developmental colleagues, um, or your GP can make a referral for an ASD assessment. They need a health and developmental check, which is why you'll probably meet one of us at St George's or outlying clinics. Um, and then you would be referred if you progress to following an observation in school to a multidisciplinary assessment. And there's a lot of work going into trying to reduce the weight for that. We know that it's a very long wait. Um, it's nationally. Um, and we've got one of our clinicians, Dr. Hudson, who you will, will have met for those who've had a recent or, or diagnosis uh, in the emerging needs team um, is uh, a, 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 a miracle worker in babies make the, the work the wait time much less and I know it can be frustrating and we can only apologize but we're working very hard to try and reduce that um, over eight it's the CAMS pathway um, and I know again we have frustrations about CAMS and I, they've had um, some money I understand to try and uh, improve their um, waiting times um, I'm, I'm hoping to hear from them to tell us what that is going to look like um, but that's over eight go this way and I'm just going to uh, direct you to the web page just tells you a little bit about that but this is relatively new it's it's essentially replaced the Garrett Park Ad advisory service team so I'm just going to have a quick swig of coffee and it's the ones with autism advisory service or WAS, WAS. Um, and um, they take children uh, under their wing from zero to 19 up to 25 in the EHCP and that's something we've been waiting for a long time so they are a support and advisory service they have an email uh, address uh, autism training sorry that's not it autism advisory at wandsworth.gov.uk and who've had letters from me recently um, I've started to include that in the letters um, uh, you can self-refer for support from Wandsworth Advisory and I understand that they are looking at um, extending their behavioural support so uh, um, they won't thank me for uh, for promoting them but that's what they're there for but um, right away they are there to help to support you and, uh, and we do hear this every now and again particularly from the children with older families with older children with AD, um, ASD that they don't know quite who to talk to but in terms of uh, Valencia asked me particularly to say what is out there this is most decidedly out there now uh, please use their service. Um, I'm just going to skip over that and again the, the out there um, quick run through we've mentioned a lot of these before the wand card please apply for a wand card it's brilliant it gets you out of the house it's things to do and the Thrive web page again I'm sure you'll be really familiar lots of activities to do in Wandsworth try them out um, it, it, it's particularly for the again the, the teenagers who are um, sat at home and wanting to look at um, their gaming systems and you a bit trapped because they won't go out and try and tempt them away with something different there's something for everybody um disability living allowance and, and pit for the older uh, older young people there um again please use any of the clinic letters uh, to apply for extra funding um they cut back on funding as you're well aware for those who uh, access universal credit um but um we will always support you with the, with our clinic letters um and occasionally we will fill in forms for you if that's if that's needed same for blue disability parking badge badge contact um, you will be aware of S super wonderful for accessing um, extra activities but being in company for those who are needing extra support in school um, YAS is the school uh, parenting su um, support uh, advocacy team which I'll come back to in a minute um, and I just wanted to point out DVLA for again for the older uh, children you must declare um, ADHD on your, um, it says autism on that, but ADHD on your um, DVLA application form, otherwise uh, you'll get in trouble later and can get fined. Okay, um, quickly, 
And just to let you know that if you weren't already aware of the Well Centre, they are amazing. It's set up by a, a, a local GP. In fact, not local, it's a Dulwich. Um, and they are based out of Herne Hill. Uh, and this is for 13 to 25s and it's a highly confidential service uh, for anybody um, not necessarily with neurodiversity but with, uh, absolutely will see all of our children mental sexual physical health um, again they have work in connection with their youth workers um, uh, and for those of the again with teens who are worried that they uh, can't have a cop and they can't get the teenager to talk these are youth workers who keep everything super confidential so they will tell you something if there's an immediate danger but otherwise if a child wants to talk about about their um, gender dysphoria or their uh, uh, or their in, in interaction with uh, drugs or alcohol, um, they will talk to their child fully confidentially. Okay, so what should an early conversation with school look like? So um, I'm going to throw some questions out there and I want to hear from you. So diagnostic labels, do you want to share that information about ADHD with your children first? Um, and with the and with the school. Now, um, I will always write to a school with your consent after a clinic. I will always ask you, and I'll say um, um, uh, Jane has been diagnosed with ADHD. Um, I've sent a leaflet on how to help manage ADHD in the classroom. Please contact me for further information. I won't mention medical history. I won't mention if you're trialing medication or not. That uh, I think is something that I hope will you will be able to you be used by you so it was a long sentence you'll be able to use that as a stimulus for conversations with the school um is there anything more that we should do is there anything more that you would like us to do um would you like it to be done on a person by person basis um what has worked and what hasn't worked um uh sorry a little informatic this, this is this dates me from the 70s from a children's tv show called we are the champion it was the champions it was a bit at the end they used to say and away you go and everyone used to pool anyway so uh, over to you what's worked what's not worked ehcps um a huge bone of contention um uh um what happens when you say okay now we've got a diagnosis of adhd can we get an ehcp what's your experience of that uh, what have school said how's what's worked what hasn't worked school exclusions internal and, and, and um internal and, ex, and external sorry I have a view on uh, uh, isolation within schools. I, I think uh, it doesn't. It, I don't think it works uh, personally. I'm not an educationalist. Uh, there may be educationalists among you who may, may have very strong evidence that, to the contrary, happy to hear from you. Specialist schools are they helpful for you? Should you get a specialist school? Why ask the parent partnership fee-paying schools and the, what 